we come with our arms open wide come stand side by side come sing with one voice come let your heart rejoice for the lord has made you a home oh the lord has made you a home and all who are weary all who need rest can come to this house and they all will be blessed no longer wander no longer roam the father's calling each one of us home and we come we come we come let's go to the top we come with our arms open wide come and stand side by side come sing with one voice come your heart will rejoice for the lord has made you a home oh the lord has made you a home and all who are weary all who need rest can come to this house and they all will be blessed we no longer wander no longer roam the father's calling each one of us home and we come we come we come come home come home Welcome. Uh, announcements. Uh, Linda McCarty died this week, last Sunday. There's a card on the back for Bill if you'd like to sign that. Any other announcements? Go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the moisture this week. Be with those that may be caught in the moisture that's too much in the flooding. Be with those who do not want to be here today. Help us when we talk to them to make them think it's important. Be with us as we hear the word today for the glory of you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture this morning, I've chosen to read from Psalms 100. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people the sheep of his pasture. 
Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Continue with our singing. You can stand if you'd like. You can sit if you'd like. It's personal preference. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power. Over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. Reign in me again. Over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. You mean more to me than any earthly thing. Won't you reign in me again, Lord? Reign in me, reign in your power. Over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. Reign in me again. Why don't we take a minute and say good morning? sunset sky, but my one request, Lord, my only aim, that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power, over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am, reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power, over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. Reign in me again. exalted king is exalted on high i will praise him he is exalted forever exalted and i will praise his name he is the lord forever his truth shall reign heaven and earth Rejoice in his holy name. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. I will praise him. He is exalted forever, exalted and I will praise his name. He is the Lord, forever his truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in his holy name. 
exalted, the King is exalted on high. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. dwelling place O oh Lord Almighty for my soul longs and even faints for you for in my heart is satisfied Within your presence, I sing beneath the shadow of your wings. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere, thousands elsewhere. One thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty, to find you in the place your glory dwells. Better is one day in your courts Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. My heart and flesh cry out, for you, the living God, your spirit's water to my soul. I've tasted and I've seen, come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day, better is one day, better is one day than thousands elsewhere, than thousands elsewhere. be seated. Come now to a time of uh, communion, most important time that we meet here this morning. Got a little test for you this morning. How many people remember the scripture reading I read first? <laughs> See, at least, at least that's good if you knew where we're from. Anyway, shout to the Lord with all your joy. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. We need to come for him because he died for us. 
Mick and I talked about this after the last board meeting, how exciting a time it should be to come to church, how exciting it is to commune with God. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it, saying, this is my body I give to you. In the same way, he took the wine, saying, this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, the new covenants. Some churches only celebrate this once a quarter. We also talked about this. How can they do that? We are here to commune with God. We should do it every day, but especially on the first part of the week when we gather together. So this is our commandment for us is to commune with God every week. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come around this table uh, specifically to remember Christ, uh, to remember his atoning sacrifice, uh, willingly giving up his heavenly home, his glory in heaven, coming to earth, living as a man, living a sinless life, and then offering that life up as a sacrifice to cleanse us of our sin. We have these emblems that remind us of the body that he offered up, the blood that he shed that covers our sin. And Father, we praise you for your plan. Christ, we thank you for your uh, courage, your love for us that brought it all to fruition. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit that has proclaimed all of this in our hearts. So Father, just now as we remember Christ and we remember uh, the, the suffering that he went through, the physical suffering the, uh, the spiritual suffering being separated from you, God, so that we do not have to endure that. So bless us, Father, now as we bless Christ and his memory, and it's in his name that I pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come to you at this time because we are just truly thankful for all the blessings you have given us in our life. Father, from day one, you created an earth for all of us to enjoy. And Lord, we just take that sometimes into granted, the fact that we have have air to breathe and uh, just the beauty that we see every day. But uh, you've given us everything on this earth that we could ask for. And at this time, we thank you for that, Lord. And all you ask is, is a tenth of that back. But Father, we pray that that tenth comes off the top and not off the bottom, whatever's left over. Because Lord, it is yours. And uh, we're just so grateful for our jobs, our employment, the health that you give us. Lord, at this time, as we present this gift to, uh, to further your kingdom here on this earth, we just ask that each, each person gives cheerfully and uh, that you just bless the gift and the giver. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Take care of it because Trace needs to breathe for a minute before he preaches. We have a special.
prayer for the McCarty family and the death of Glenda. We ask you to be with all that are sick. Joy puts this on the website so or the app so you can pray individually for each of them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son that died for us, for your comfort he gives us, for the wisdom we get from studying your word. Be with the McCarty family in their time of loss, but we know Glenda will be with you. Be with each of us as we go out this week, that we may be example for the people that do not want to be here, that we can show them that it's important. Be with each of the one as we study the word, listen to Trace's message today. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I still need more breath. I had trouble putting the message together this week because I could not, I couldn't narrow it down. So finally I was able to get somewhere, but there's just a thousand different directions you can run with, with this commandment we're going to look at today. Um, <clears throat> it's the fifth commandment. Anybody know off the top of your head what the fifth commandment is? Yes, sir. Honor your father and mother. And as Paul points out in Ephesians, this is the first command with a promise. So that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So there's a couple of parts to this command that makes it just a little bit more difficult. Um, <clears throat> at least for a message because honor your father and mother, like you, you can just imagine all the different directions you can go with that and all the different places in the Bible where it talks about family and talks about honoring parents and, and things. So it was a little bit tough. And then it, it has another part to it that, that we don't see in the other commands, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. So, you know, there's a lot going on there. Now, if you've been trying to keep up, we've been looking at the Ten Commandments. We're on the fifth one. Each of the Ten Commandments is also commanded in the New Testament in so many words. Now, remember the Sabbath is not specifically quoted, but all the rest of them are specifically quoted. And even the principle behind the Sabbath to rest in the Lord and to, and to, to honor Him and, and keep His name and His time holy is, is still there in the New Testament. In Matthew 19, Jesus repeats five of them in one statement to the rich young ruler. And then he also adds the other law that sums up all the rest, to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, I've already mentioned the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6 mentions this one specifically. Now, before we get going, I want to point out the command to honor your father and mother is not a command for children. All right, do not think that I'm going to talk to you about showing your kids how to honor your parents. That's part of it. But the command in that regard is parents, teach your children to obey and honor you. Because I don't think we can wait until, you know, four-year-old Johnny memorizes the Ten Commandments before we start teaching him to honor his parents. They need to learn this a long time before they learn how to read so this is, this is not a command that Jesus or God intended for children specifically. In fact, I would say secondarily it goes to children. Primarily it goes to those of us who are mature enough to understand what it means to respect and honor our parents. That's what I think. Because four-year-olds can't read. <laughs> they can certainly learn. But they have to be taught and the rest of us, we're old enough to see for ourselves and know better. So I think this command is a lot broader than what sometimes we apply it. I mean, after all, how did your children learn to, or how are they learning to honor and obey you? 
You know, it's not by memorization. It's not by, you know, them sitting down and having a disciplined Bible study in their own little quiet time. I don't know any four-year-olds that do that. And if we did, I'd be scared, you know. <laughs> like, either, you know, the next prophet of God's coming along or something's wrong. I was not that kid. And as you probably suspect, uh, there's not that many kids around that are like that. So this command is as much for adults. Each command addresses a principle that I believe is a universal principle. When I say that, what I mean is something that is true and applicable and should be followed at all times, at all places, by all people, regardless of circumstances. So I think there's a principle behind each one of these commands that falls into that category. And I think these commands and their principles are as relevant today as they were 3,500 years ago when God first gave them to Moses on the stone tablets. So we come to this one, honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land the Lord is giving you. So there's a command and then there's the promise. There's two parts. So we're going to look at those two parts today. And the first part is this command. And to start, you know, thinking in long terms of this principle I'm going to introduce to you, I want to ask you to think about this. Have you ever felt lonely? Well, of course you have. What was the loneliest moment of your life? I think some of you can probably think of something like along those lines too. And it probably has to do with the loss of a loved one. Experts claim that loneliness may be the number one problem in America. You know, they were saying that depression was the number one problem, but now they've shifted to say, well, what is the cause of this depression? And they're beginning to come to this conclusion for the time being, because I'm not a real fan of pop psychology, but I think they do have an ability to identify our problems. They just don't have much of an ability to solve our problems. So loneliness may be the number one problem in America. Dr. Gary Collins, you probably haven't heard of him, well, Denise is in counseling. She's heard of him. <laughs> He's the former president of the American Association of Christian Counselors and the founder of the magazine Christian Counseling Today. He wrote this. He said, loneliness is the painful awareness that we lack meaningful contact with others. It involves a feeling of inner emptiness, which can be accompanied by sadness, discouragement, a sense of isolation, restlessness, anxiety, and intense desire to be wanted and needed by someone. And I'm glad I wasn't in one of his classes because I know he would have made me memorize that. And I would have had trouble because he says a lot. The cause of loneliness or rather the causes, are, are endless. There's you know, longer, a list longer than my arm. Low self-esteem, shyness, unresolved conflict, separation, rejection, illness, criticism, busyness, fear, paranoia, all kinds of causes. It's been scientifically demonstrated that loneliness also adversely affects you spiritually, physically, emotionally and mentally. It will affect your eating habits. It will affect your sleeping habits. It will affect your alertness and your mood. Loneliness affects your ability to interact with other people. In fact, we've created an entire category of labels and stereotypes to describe all the, the Beatles say, all the lonely people. We've got latchkey kids. Anybody ever heard that term? It's been around for 30, 40 years now. A kid who comes home alone to an empty house after school is a latchkey kid. Single parent. We use that phrase all the time. Oh, they're a single parent. That's a mother or a father who raises and supports children alone. Huge responsibility. We've got even an older term, widow or widower. That'd be a person whose spouse has died and now that person is alone. 
homeless person. We got all kinds of names for that. But that's a person without a home or a family who is alone. So, you know, we've even got its own, in fact, loneliness, it's even got its own term of its own word, a loner. Somebody who prefers to go it alone. I know what that's like because there were a lot of times when I was younger I thought I was a leader, but I was running so far ahead of everybody I was actually a loner. <laughs> that's the difference. A leader, people follow. A loner, ain't nobody behind him. And so I'd look back and say, whoops, where'd everybody go? God created the entire world and the universe. And he looked down and he said, it is good. And then a few verses later, for the very first time in Scripture, he looks down and he sees Adam, who's all alone, and he said, it is not good. The very first thing that God says is not good is the fact that Adam was alone. So to solve this problem, God created Eve. Thus, he created the first family, a man and a woman, perfectly suited for each other, physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, at every level, they are suited for each other. And then God told them to have children. So you see, the answer that God has provided to loneliness is family. And this is where the fifth commandment becomes significant to you and me. Honoring your father and your mother preserves the integrity of the family. And it protects each member of the family from loneliness. This morning I want to walk through a three-step process to help us more deeply understand this concept of the family that God has created. Because it is God's first and best answer to the problem of loneliness. Step one, we must obey the precept. A precept is a law or a command of God. The precept here is marriage. God has intended for a man and a woman to live together as husband and wife, not Adam and Steve, but Adam and Eve. But also not as two individuals trying to share all the benefits of marriage without the commitment. I don't think we clearly understand the consequences of doing that. We don't understand the erosive nature of enjoying or trying to enjoy the benefits of a marriage without the commitment and devotion behind it. There's always an emptiness, always a question that the devotion of marriage solves. And some of us are looking at it, well, you know, it's kind of like burning the ships once you get to the new land. Yes, it is. Just making a commitment and say, I'm never going back. That's the kind of commitment God makes when He makes a promise to us, and that's the kind of promise He expects us to make to each other as His children, as His creation created in His image. That's the expectation. A strong family starts with a man and a woman being completely devoted to each other at every turn, at every level. I can't tell you how much it means to know that someone has always got my back because they said so and they continue to remind me every day. Whereas I'm afraid those couples that, well, some of you may even have experienced it. You just kind of decided it was cool to move in together and for a long, long time you just had this fear in the back of your mind, well, I'm not going to get married because they may change their mind. I'll tell you what, when I went through the vows, it hit me. I don't get to change my mind. And you know what? Mom and dad raised a pretty good kid, and he knew how to make a pretty good decision. And even if I wasn't the greatest candidate for a husband, like I said, they raised a pretty good kid, and I know how to learn. So Christy and I burned the ships and never looked back. At least not that we're admitting to. There's been days. 
She wondered why she married me. Her parents wonder why she married me. My parents wonder why she married me. <laughs> you know, God only knew. A strong family starts with a man and a woman being completely devoted to each other. Genesis 2.24, right after creation. God creates Eve and puts, him with the, puts her with the man and says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And Jesus repeated and reinforced this precept in Mark 10, 9, he said, what God has joined together, and the old-fashioned phrase is, let no man put asunder. Uh, that means just don't let anybody come between it, separate it. You guys share a bond and you guys stick together. You might pick on me, but don't you dare try to come between me and my wife. You know the old saying, don't try to interrupt two brothers that are fighting because they'll both turn on you? Well, that's what ought to happen in marriage, too. They ought to turn on you if you try to come between them. And we will. <laughs> because that's what it means to be completely devoted. That's what it means to have somebody's back. And that's what we've got. So, we've got this concept, this precept, this law of marriage. And it's difficult. It's, it, nobody's going to pretend that being married solves all of your life's problems. In fact, being married creates its own set of problems. People that are married have sets of problems that people aren't married just don't have. And some people have decided, I'm just not going to have those problems. You know, they just stay single. And then there's some people, you're going to have all those problems without the commitment. And that doesn't make it, it makes even less sense to me. Why would anybody want all the problems that marriage has created without that commitment? I, I just, it's not worth it. Is it, Christy? <laughs> She's shaking her head. But I have experienced at least two priceless benefits from being married. When you are married, you do not have to face your problems alone. You shouldn't have to face them alone when you're married. Number two, when you are married, loneliness should not be one of your problems. I know what happens. Couples, you know, they're sharing the same room, but they feel a million miles apart. So it's... We aren't perfect, but God has provided the perfect solution, and that is marriage. God knows that being alone is not a good thing, so he gave us marriage and family so that we wouldn't have to be alone. So, first step, obey the precept. Second step, discover the principle. All right, now this is not for children. Children don't understand principles. When my son was three or four years old, we had rules. Don't touch the oven. All right, at three years old, I wasn't going to sit down and explain to him how an oven worked and why it was hot and what the effect of burn. He wouldn't have understood it if I tried to describe it to him. He just had a rule, and it's don't touch the oven or I'll smack your hand. Or mom will, because she was sitting, standing at the oven more than I was. At a certain point, he didn't need that rule anymore. A couple things happened. One... He grabbed Christie's curling iron one time. <laughs> that was a painful lesson. So he learned what touching something hot and getting burned was like. But more than that, he grew up. He got to a point where he understood the oven. He didn't have to have a rule that says don't touch the oven because he already understood the principle behind the rule. Well, Today, we're talking about the principles behind the rule. A four-year-old needs to be told, honor your parents. They're not going to understand why. You and I, we're going to understand why, aren't we? The principle behind the precept that God has given us regarding marriage is a universal principle. And it's in the couple of verses I just read for you. And it's the principle of unity. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. You see the theme of unity in there? Of course you do. The word's even used. Mark 10, 9, Jesus said, What God has joined together, let no man separate. Once again, there's this principle of unity. God values unity. Jesus prayed in John 17, 21. And if you look at John chapter 13, verses 
chapter 17. That is the most intimate expression or intimate exposure of Jesus we get in Scripture. He is pouring his heart out to God in prayer. And he knows his time is coming to die for mankind. And he's praying, you know, even to the point of, Lord, Father, if there's any other way. So we see this most intimate time of prayer. We see him, you know, he knows he's going to get a few words left and a little bit of time to talk to his disciples. So he's being very direct and very intimate and very serious with them. And he says this when he's praying, Father, make them one as you and I are one. Paul echoes the same sentiment in Ephesians. He says, in chapter 4, verse 3, he says, and you've heard this before, you just didn't remember it was here. Make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit. This principle of unity is huge. And, and it doesn't take a genius to figure it out. It doesn't take a particularly spiritual person to figure it out. We've all heard the phrase, united we stand, divided we fall. So if you want to stand, if you want to remain strong, then unity is the order of the day. If you want to expose yourself, let disunity reign. Must be unified. Unity is the opposite of loneliness. The two cannot coexist. And by definition, when two people are united, they do not have to fear being lonely anymore. So, obey the precept, discover the principle, and third, get to know the person behind the principle. God is one. Have you heard that statement before? All the precepts and principles that God has given us flow from His character, His nature, who He is. In addition to Exodus 20, the account of the Ten Commandments is also recorded in Deuteronomy 5. And Paul, or Moses gives all the commandments there, and it takes the entire chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, the fourth verse, right after it's wrapped up, after he finish, finishes you know, giving people the law and reading it for them, in chapter 6 and verse 4, right after the law, he says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, is, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unity. So this concept of unity is attached to the law. Literally, literally in Scripture, literarily, it's the word I want. And it actually makes sense. God is one and He created us in His image. Therefore, we should strive to reflect and demonstrate unity in our marriages, in our families, in our relationships with each other. With each, uh, with each other. <laughs> God designed us to live together. In harmony, in unity. And this is why disunity is destructive. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You feel it and you felt it and, and you, you, it's a tough one. I'll, I'll give you. Disunity is destructive to your marriage. It's destructive to your family. It will destroy any relationship you have. Without unity, though, life is lonely. So... Obey the principle, marriage and family is the fundamental structure that God has provided and created in order for us to have a godly community and to, and to not be alone. Discover the precept, the unity is, God's, unity is God's answer to loneliness. And know the person, God is one. So we should live as one, and when we do this, we will not have to fear loneliness. So honoring your father and mother preserves the unity of the family and in turn society and the rest of the world. It protects every person from the threat of loneliness. But there's a second part to this command. He says, so that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. The Apostle Paul points this out. He even says, says this is the first commandment with a promise. This promise or this blessing isn't quoted nearly as often as the first part. It's one of those scriptures we like to just honor, you know, you know, honor your father and mother. And we forget about the other part. It's kind of like uh, when we, you know, men like to say, well, you know, man's the head of the house and women should submit. And we forget to read the rest of it. Men, you should give yourself up 
as Christ gave himself up. We don't like to quote that part. Well, maybe we forget to quote this part the same way. However, we're not going to overlook it today. That you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. It's probably not going to surprise you, but when I was studying this week, I just found one of the problems I ran into is that not all scholars agree on what this means. You can go to four different scholars, five different scholars, and you'll get five different answers. Um, it's kind of like, you know, we're two or three Baptists are gathered, there's four or five opinions. That's one of the old jokes I used to tell my Baptist friends. It's hard to make jokes about us because our label is so generic. Nobody knows who we're talking about. So I had to use Baptist. Next time I'll use the Methodist and somebody else, they, you know, spread it around. Some scholars believe this promise is specific. They say it refers directly to the promise that God had given Abraham nearly 400 years before the Exodus. Isn't it right? About 430 years, you know, before they entered the promised land, or actually, I mean, before, before this law was given, um, God had promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation and that they would live in the promised land in Canaan. When the Hebrews honored their parents and the covenant that God had made with their parents, they lived a long and fruitful life in Canaan. When they did not honor that covenant, an enemy would come in, conquer them, and they'd lose their land, and then they'd repent and God would restore it. So it's got a very specific application. If you honor your folks, if you honor your parents, um, you remain in the land and live well. And back then, in agrarian society, your land was everything. You raised your livestock, you raised your crops. If you didn't have your land, how were you going to eat? You were going to be beholden to someone else, probably a slave, or maybe a nicer word to put it would be a bondservant, but you would just end up being a slave if you didn't honor your parents. So there's a specific application to it. Other scholars think that though it has a general application, they say that a society where senior citizens are honored and cared for, you can look forward to enjoying the same honor and care someday when you are older. We're all going to be there. Their reasoning is that life is sacred and those who gave you life are to be honored and respected because of that. And guess what? They're right too. So there is a specific application and there's a general application, but some scholars think there's something else. Some believe that the, the passage is figurative. They say that the promised land in which God was giving the Hebrews is symbolic of being in fellowship with God and honoring your parents who gave you life is symbolic of honoring God who is the ultimate giver of life. So living long in the promised land remains, means remaining in the fellowship with God and honoring your parents. And you know, they're probably mostly right on that too. And of course, some scholars finally, they say, well, no, this is all spiritual. Especially New Testament scholars. It holds a similar view of you know, the figurative guys. Honoring your parents is a way of honoring God. Because God your parents gave you life, and God is the ultimate giver of life. So honoring your parents is honoring God. And they say the promised land, though, is our spiritual inheritance. It is heaven. And that living long in the land the Lord your God has given to you is just a different way of saying spending eternity in heaven because you have honored your parents and followed the commands and honored God. And that's kind of right, too. I mean, it's really about grace. It's not about earning your way or you know, scoring a high enough grade to get into heaven. Do not worry about scoring a high enough grade to get into heaven because you can't. You will not score high enough to get into heaven. But there's something to be said for your faith not being dead and working itself out in honoring your parents. A person that doesn't honor his parents and that doesn't love and honor God makes me question their faith, doesn't it? Now, I'm not their judge, and it's good because I don't know how to do that, and I'd be a bad one. But I do think we have a spiritual inheritance in the kingdom of God, and those of us that will love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, 
these commandments would be nothing. It'd just be commonplace. It'd just be the most natural thing. You don't have to choose which one of these applications makes the most sense to you. One of the qualities of Scripture is, that affirms, in my mind anyway, that it is divinely inspired is that these truths, like so many in Scripture, are kind of like the layers of an onion. You can just peel more layers back. And, and the more you go, the deeper it gets. And, 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 of course, just like working with an onion, it humbles you. <laughs> <laughs> and tears may be a part of the process. God's promise is specific. Families should be the best defense against the evils of this world, so honor your parents. God's promise is general. You need someone to care for you someday, so set a good example and honor your parents. God's promise is figurative. Honoring your parents honors God, and remaining in a fellowship with God means remaining in fellowship with your parents. So honor your parents. And God's promise is figurative. I mean, I'm sorry, is spiritual. The promise of heaven is reserved for those who do the will of the Father and who come to Him and, and, and are saved by grace through faith. Honoring your parents is honoring God. And to dishonor your parents is to dishonor God. Now, maybe it occurred to you already, but if it hasn't, I'm going to bring it up now. God has called himself our Father. Think about this. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray by starting saying, Our Father. And the commandment here today tells us to honor our Father. I want to share a quote with you from the late Harvey Goodwin. I don't expect you to know who that guy was, but he was a bishop in the Anglican Church in the mid-19th century, the 1800s. And he held doctoral degrees in mathematics and law and religion. So this guy was smart and highly educated. He got his degrees from Cambridge and Oxford. He was one of the most popular preachers in England during his lifetime. And he was specifically asked to preach at Westminster Abbey on the following Sunday after Charles Darwin's funeral. Because they all know who Charles Darwin was, and we do too. And he was the one asked to preach on the Sunday after, his, after this guy's funeral because they knew Goodwin being a scientist and mathematician as well as a theologian probably be best capable of addressing a lot of people's questions about Mr. Darwin. And there were a lot even in his day. Rightly so. Bishop Goodwin finally passed away in 1891. He wrote this probably about 1856 or either 61, somewhere right there. And you got to realize he's using words that have a uh, 18th or 1800s definition. All right, so they don't mean exactly the same or have the same connotation that they do now. He wrote this. He said, "And so when God condescends to call Himself our Father, now see, there's one of those words, condescends. We use that in a totally negative fashion. What he's saying is when God." lowers himself and limits himself to call himself our father because God is so much more than just father. To call God father doesn't speak to everything that God is. So that is the sense in which he's condescended. You know, it, it, it's, it's like if somebody just wanted to say, this is this trace, ah, he's just preacher. I am so much more than a preacher. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a woodworker. And and I'm a great food eater. So much more than just father. So much more than just preacher. So much more. So when God condescends to call himself our father, the clouds which conceal him from our sight seem to break and vanish. And we feel that we can love and honor him, not merely acknowledge him, 
and we feel we can refuse to accept others beside him, not merely fear him as one too powerful to be safely said is not. That is ignored, okay? Thought nothing of. Not merely philosophize about him, but try to express his infinite being in some scientific formula of human words. No. But love him as a father ought to be loved with all our hearts and souls and strength. You see, in a sense, this command doesn't just add to the list of commandments by telling us that we've got the fifth one now. We've got five now. It's not that way at all. This command sums up the first four commandments. If you truly honor your Father, your Heavenly Father, you'll have no other gods before Him. You'll worship Him alone. You won't disrespect His name. And you will regularly seek His rest in His presence as a Sabbath see and I thought that was ingenious these commandments have not been given randomly and they've not been given in a strange order there's actually an order to the order of the Ten Commandments and this is part of it have you honored your father and mother have you honored your father God and how and if you search yourself for answers to these questions and you are coming up short of an answer. Maybe it's time to repent and come back to God and begin to honor them. Because this is, should not be a tough question to answer. But if it is, it's time for you to turn back. It's time for you to get close with God. Start honoring Him and your parents again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for giving us your son Jesus. I thank you that He's taught us to respect you as Father and that He is first among many children. Lord, show us to be Christ-like. Show us how to honor our parents and honor you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. And I guess I don't have any guitar, do I? It's giving me fits. Huh? Well, we'll do that when we close, but I'm... Hmm? Yes, sir. I got to think of one. I don't know. Anybody thought of a song while I was preaching? Yes. Well, it's kind of an upbeat invitation song, but I'm up for it. We shall enter his gates with thanksgiving in our heart. We'll enter his courts with praise. We will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Okay, well, I got a... I got a call, a request for a song. Now I got a request. Somebody would like to dismiss us in prayer? Any volunteers? I'm not opposed to anybody. Okay, Fred just got volunteered by Denise. <laughs> All right. Brother Fred.
Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. Reign in me again. Have a good week.